The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Lauren Clementino, a librarian at the Flagstaff City Coconino County Public Library and member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit questions via the questions box in the control panel. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Our technical director today is Patricia Jimenez. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the questions box. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number and access code provided in your registration confirmation email. When you exit this session, you will be directed to a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. I'd also like to announce the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On August 13th, 2020, there will be a panel discussion on, on cultural competencies in the workplace with panelists Elise Jordan, Sheila Paul Shedd, Jessica Sallow, and Brad Vogus. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar advertised in the monthly professional development newsletter and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. And speaking of the monthly webinar series, the professional development committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. Go to tinyurl.com backslash AZLA PD presenter form to submit your idea. Also find a link in your professional development monthly newsletter. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Now I will pass presenter privileges to Ashley Gore, the 2019 Horner Fellow, who will share her experiences visiting Japan. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Let me go ahead and hit present on this, awesome. Um, so, like it was just announced, my name is Michelle Ashley Gore. I'm going to be talking to you today about the Horner Fellowship. If you don't know what the Horner Fellowship is, that's awesome. I'm going to tell you what it is and then I'm going to show you what it is. Um, but to start off, this is me. I prefer to go by Ashley. My pronouns are she and they. And I'm a first year experience librarian at Arizona State University. And what that means is that I work with a lot of um, high school students uh, teaching information literacy courses in order to prepare them for college. So I, in my capacity, serve kind of as a bridge or a welcome for a lot of new students to help them um, acclimatize to 
college and what college life is like. And it's also helpful to already know somebody who's there when you go. So I don't only work with um, students coming right from high school, but I also work with transfer students, graduate students. And most importantly, and why I decided to apply for this fellowship is that I work with a lot of international students. Um, and so this experience was really important for me and I thought it would be very helpful in informing my understanding of where a lot of international students are coming from, um, what their cultures are like, what they might feel and experience while they're here and how is that different. Um, just to make my practice a lot better than it is. And also that makes my practice better for other students as well. So students who even are coming from the United States but might be coming from different states. So my contact information is right there. Um, if you have any questions about the Horner Fellowship or about my experience, please feel free to email me. Uh, there is also a blog and an Instagram that I had set up before leaving about my experience where I live blogged and took pictures of a lot of things while I was there. Um, so you can go through and look at everything uh, that I was up to, what I was researching uh, outside of this presentation, because an hour is not enough time to talk about three weeks in Japan and everything I've learned. Um, so please visit those. They have a lot of additional information. And uh, there is a link that was put in chat right now. This is a document where I have compiled every single link and all of the relevant information and also some background information for my presentation right now. Please feel free to click through it as I'm talking. Um, and that also includes a link to my presentation slides because it is unlikely we're going to get through the whole thing because I get really excited and there's a lot to talk about. So. What I'm going to talk about in this is just to give a very brief overview of the Horner Fellowship, what it is, how to apply, um, what my research proposal was, what I was doing in Japan, what the experience was like, my takeaways and what I learned. And finally, you all can have about 15 minutes or more in the end to ask any questions you'd like. So first one is what is the Horner Fellowship? So the Horner Fellowship is an endowment for the AZLA from Leighton Jack Horner and his wife, Marion. And what this fellowship does is that it funds every other year a librarian from Arizona to travel to Japan um, to facilitate informational exchanges, understand what our colleagues in Japan are doing, but also foster cultural education. And then on those off years, a librarian from Japan will come to Arizona and do the same thing. Um, as you can imagine, this year has been postponed a little bit, but if you are interested in applying for the Horner Fellowship, in that document that was linked in the chat, you can actually go to the Horner page, and it includes a lot of um, important information on how to apply, which is usually posted at the beginning of the year that it would be um, an Arizona librarian's turn to go to Japan, so that'll be beginning of next year. Uh, but also you can look at all of the reports from all of the fellows that have gone to Japan and that have come to Arizona. It is really fascinating and really awesome um, what other people have done. And then get more information about the fellowship committee, who are the folks that review proposals and applications and choose who will be going. So for me in particular, when I submitted for the Horner Fellowship, um, my passion, in addition to what I do, which is welcoming a lot of students onto campus, um, is social justice and equity. So what I wanted to visit Japan for is to investigate the role of the education system um, and how that plays into formulating national identity, ide ideological formation, and how those things and globalization are being related to contemporary Japanese students' understanding of social justice, how they experience um, social justice and maybe discrimination, um, and then also informed by my personal research interests, which is uh, post-war student social movements in Japan. So I've been interested in Japan for a very, very long time, um, particularly 1960s and 70s activism in Japan. So I was really excited to get chosen for this because I got to go to a lot of different institutions and look at um, some ephemera from the 60s and 70s. But 
Before I go into all of that, I'm going to try to give as concise and brief of a background as I can about this topic. Um, but again, in that document that I linked, there's an entire link to my project proposal and tons and tons of links about the background and the history of Japan and post-war movements and everything like that. So, um, like any country, uh, Japan and the United States struggle with um, issues of discrimination. So, in Japan, what I have found in my studies is that a lot of the discrimination experience there is highly linked and related to a lot of what we in the United States experience as well. And a variety of researchers have kind of linked this to the post-war occupation of Japan. So there's a lot of discrimination against racial and ethnic minorities, indigenous communities like the Okinawans and Ainu. Um, different social castes, women, LGBTQIA plus folks, immigrants and foreign laborers, particularly ethnic Koreans, persons with disability, etc. And so I work with, in my capacity, a lot of student activists and organizers here on campus. Um, and so I was really interested to see what parallels there were between student activism in Japan and student activism in the United States. Uh, because historically, very particularly in the 60s, Japan drew a lot of its activist techniques and a lot of um, the issues that they talked about actually from um, different movements in the United States, uh, particularly student movements from Berkeley. Um, and so uh, we don't hear a lot about Japanese radical activists. Um, and I think that's for a variety of reasons, but Japan has a long, long, long history of radical activism. And so a lot of that is in post-war Japan. So we have um, the formation of the new left, 1960s Japanese student movements, and what's called the AMPO protests, which were protests over the renewing of the security treaty between Japan and the US. And then most recently is the anti-nuclear power movement, which was which took place predominantly after Fukushima. And there are some really great links in that document that I included there. And one that was actually just written, um, I think on July 1st about uh, Black Lives Matter movements in Japan, which is just another contemporary example of how uh, Japan and Japanese students are taking a lot of cues from the United States and how globalization and a lot of that like cultural exchange is facilitating these social justice movements. So finally, culture and perception clearly is very different in Japan than it is here. Um, so what I heard over and over again in Japan when uh, discussing social justice, either with activists or with administrators, is that in their culture, they really value uh, this concept of oneness and harmony. I can't remember the Japanese word for it. I wrote it down somewhere in my notes. Um, but there is a very specific word for it. So harmony and oneness among um, all of the people. And uh, that is enacted in a variety of different ways. So what I mostly heard a lot of people say when I asked explicitly, like, do you have any organizations or do you work on any of these projects? Um, I, I would often hear people say the nail that sticks up gets the hammer, um, kind of, which is a kind of similar statement to what we say here, which is like the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, but it was really interesting hearing that over and over again and how that played into like a similar but different understanding of social justice and how you as a society choose to address that. So my itinerary, uh, if you get selected as a Horner Fellow, you work with the Horner Fellow Committee, but also the JLA, which is the Japanese Library Association, and they will help uh, pick places that you will visit. I decided I wanted to conduct interviews um, just because that was that method made sense to me. I really wanted to understand how they practice and how they personally feel. Um, about their work and their practice. Um, 
And so the, the institutions I visited were libraries, both public and academic, some archives, research facilities, museums, and activist collectives. So the activist collectives I had to organize on my own. Uh, I actually provided a list of places that I had pre-researched, but any Horner Fellow doesn't need to do that. They are provided with your research proposal, and then they can um, do some research and figure out what places you might like to visit or what you might like to see. But just because I already had some really specific places I wanted to go to, they helped facilitate me getting into those places, some of which were very difficult to get in, like the National Diet. Um, and in this case, I wasn't um, going to ask or didn't feel comfortable asking the Japanese Library Association to, for example, facilitate a meeting between myself and Antifa. That's not something I felt was um, entirely appropriate. So I did that on my own and I took an extra third week because a Horner Fellowship is a two week long trip. I took a third week in order to set up all of my own uh, meetings with activists. And then I created um, some interviews, which were then sent to and approved by the Japanese Library Association. Um, and then I had my full two weeks just kind of doing that. And then I'm going to go through a bunch of pictures and what I've learned. And a really, really important part about the Horner Fellowship is the immersion. Um, but I really wanted to go into this from a very anti-ethnocentric understanding because I understand that as somebody from the United States, my understanding of social justice and what I think is just and equitable might be different or be spoken differently um, in other countries. And so I tried very, very hard to really immerse myself in the culture, which is the purpose of um, the, the trip just to begin with, because you, you don't always have a translator. Most of the time you're actually alone. You only have a translator doing those times that you visit institutions. So it really is immersive. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, especially how to deal with that with anxiety, please <laughs> send me an email. But it was a wonderful experience, absolutely life changing. So anti ethnocentric is very critical about that. These are just some of the locations I visited uh, because Tokyo is a mega city. There are a lot of places to visit there. And sometimes it's a little hard to get around um, just quickly if you're having a lot of different interviews during the day. So I'm mostly concentrated on universities and research institutions in Tokyo. Um, and then I did spend a couple days in Kyoto, which was absolutely amazing, visiting some of their libraries and archives. And then my independent research, I visited a lot of activist collectives and spaces um, and even dormitories and student clubs and stuff like that. All right, so we're going to start off with Tokyo. Hello, Tokyo. So these might have a little bit of trouble loading. There are a lot of pictures <laughs> in this presentation. So apologies if some don't load. So my very first stop, I think on my second or third day um, in Japan was Sophia University. So what happens when you get to Japan is that you, first of all, arrive at the airport and then you have to navigate to your hotel, which the Japanese Library Association sets up all accommodations ahead of time for you, which is so, so helpful. Um, and then the first day they give you to kind of acclimatize to the very different uh, time zone, uh, which was perfect for me because I'm absolutely a night owl. So if you are a night owl, Japan will be great for you. I was a day person in Japan, but they give you a day to acclimatize and then you have dinner with the entire Japanese Library Association committee. You get to meet everyone. You get to meet previous Horner Fellows. It's really, really awesome. It is a super great experience and everyone is incredibly nice. Um, but then they immediately get you to work. So my days were absolutely packed. And in Japan, um, the public transit system is amazing. It is just as amazing as you heard. This is one of the things that absolutely holds true. Um, you can go anywhere in the Tokyo area and it's very easy. So there's a lot of walking and my legs hurt very bad. But my first stop, Sophia University. So at Sophia University, I went to a couple places here. That's the picture of it in the top left. So I went to the library and the Sophia University Institute of Global Concern. And I'll explain that in a minute. But so here are some of the pictures. When I was in the library, um, because this was the first place I visited, um, it's very natural that I 
had just arrived in Japan and I still wasn't really used to the different ways people communicate, what is considered rude, what is considered polite, what types of questions um, would be offensive, what wouldn't. So this first interview, um, it went really well, but I would say it was a little rough. And I also wasn't quite familiar with my translators yet. Um, so it was just uh, a little difficult, but not in a bad way because I was actively learning. I felt uncomfortable because I was learning about the culture and learning what questions and what language they use to describe these things. So in this library tour, like many of my other library tours, um, they seemed to be confused at some of the questions I was asking about social justice, namely, do you ever have any events around social justice? Do you have a student population who's LGBTQIA? So questions like that. Um, how do you perform outreach? What types of collections do you own uh, that might talk about uh, discrimination or something? And most of the answers I got was, we don't do that. The nail that sticks up gets the hammer. We can't talk about that here. We have to be neutral, um, which is absolutely understandable. But then they said, what you might want to do is go talk to our Institute of Global Concern. And this was one of the first indicators that I was like, OK, I clearly don't understand anything about Japanese culture. And I'm bringing a lot of my bias into this because I assumed um, it was situated similar to, similarly to the United States. So Sophia, for example, is a private university. Most universities in Japan are actually private. There's very few public universities, I think. Hopefully I didn't get that backwards. Um, and a lot of the universities are American schools, so established to be bilingual schools. And this is one of them. Uh, but the libraries, are very, very general collections, extremely general and mostly study spaces. And they are staffed by people, uh, I wish I had a little more time to explain this, but the Masters of Library Science is not quite the same in Japan and librarianship isn't exactly a career. Their entire kind of workforce is just organized very, very differently than the United States you apply to and work for a company or a large conglomerate or group, um, and then they move you around. You rotate jobs every couple of years, and that's just what you do. So every three or four years, you rotate a job. And sometimes if you work for a university system, you might rotate into the position of a librarian. So you don't have formal, quote unquote, formal training. Um, you learn for that three years and then rotate into another position. So the librarians here, unless they happen to go abroad, say come to the United States or go to Canada and get a master's of library and information science, they don't have a degree and learned most of it while they were there, um, which clearly is going to kind of um, affect some of their answers and some of their their understanding about these topics in a way that would be different than if I were talking to somebody, say, at ASU, someone who actually chose librarianship as a career. Um, so that was really interesting to learn. Um, and it took me a minute to get used to that. So when I was asking these questions, they were a little confused, but then they sent me to this institute. And that's what I was trying to get at is that most universities have general libraries, but they aren't the same as they are here. Almost every single specific institute or what we would call like a college in the university has their own library. So the Institute of Global Concern at Sophia had their own library. And this is where all of the really hardcore social justice stuff were. So you can see a couple sections right there. There was a whole section on socialism, communism, and anarchism. And then there was this hipster Hitler um, magazine a whole bunch of other really interesting stuff. So I quickly had to kind of move around a little bit of my itinerary and schedule to ask to see these institutes instead of the general libraries, because um, what I found is that I didn't get a whole lot out of the general libraries because they are generalized collections. What I needed to do is go to these specialized institute libraries. Um, and the reason I chose Sophia is because it is very well known to have a lot of faculty that work there who are activists, international activists, and work a lot on transnational justice projects. I included some of those links in the chat there. 
Um, I see someone in the audience said they don't see the link that I referred to. Okay, there it is. So, um, yeah, you can check out some of the links there. I was also able to meet with some of the professors on my own time, some of the student activists there, and I even saw a documentary at a film festival about Korean comfort women that was showing at a limited release while I was there in Japan, which was incredibly interesting because also while I was there, there was a very, very large um, protest and movement against Shinzo Abe and the LDP Liberal Democratic Party for removing a statue of a Korean comfort woman at an art exhibit. So it was very interesting. I was able to attend that. But oh, and Pope Francis was also there, <laughs> was also at Sophia while I was visiting. So that's another interesting, interesting thing. Um, yeah, and then you can see there was a student club down on the bottom right corner that I met with as well called Speak Up Sophia. Um, and they are a feminist student club on campus uh, that discuss issues of consent, which is uh, very much an issue that's discussed a lot in Japan. Okay, I promise I won't spend that much time on these other ones, but the second one I visited was Hosei University. This one was also very interesting. You see they had what they called a cultural diversity corner. Um, and those books were mostly like young adult books, just kind of about different cultures, but still very much from a Japanese perspective. And this interview was also really difficult, um, but they were very nice. Every single person I ever met with was absolutely amazing and kind and exciting. Um, they're really wonderful, but usually when I would ask questions like, do you have any LGBTQ students? They'd say, no, no, we don't have any LGBTQ students here. But then, as you can see on the bottom right hand corner, um, somebody who was working there had a sticker on her badge that said LGBTQ friendly. So clearly they think about it and it's important for them to think about and individuals themselves are concerned about these things. But when I talk to administrators, because they didn't necessarily choose librarianship as a career and are um, representatives of the corporation that they work for, they oftentimes can't talk about some of this stuff, understandably. Um, so Jose was really interesting um, in that way because this was my second place that I visited and I was still trying to get used to uh, what types of questions should I use instead of using the word social justice, which has like a really heavy connotation for them, uh, which I'll describe later as related to um, some of the new left protests in Japan. They prefer using words like harmony and other other things that that make a little bit more sense um, in a cultural context. Very interestingly, as part of Jose University, there's the O'Hara Institute for Social Research. So I um, this is on one of the Jose campuses that is outside of the Tokyo metro area. It's the Tama campus. But this is actually a not only an institute, but it is a very, very, very large archive that has, this is probably one of my favorite places I visited. It was just mind blowing. They had so much like radical activist stuff there. So the Das Kapital um, photo there, that's actually a signed copy by Karl Marx of Das Kapital. And I learned here that communism, um, and I knew this from my research, but communism is still, a really prominent political ideology in Japan. And after I learned this, I kind of started to notice like how deeply ingrained it is in Japanese culture. Um, for example, in like the rotational job systems and in a lot of ways that they've organized different things. It's just really fascinating. So there's a lot of Marxist stuff um, that I came across when I started doing this research. And you can see there's a lot of protest stuff. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't or I can't post most of the pictures that I took in Japan because they are very uh, careful and protective of a lot of their, their things that they have. So these are just some of the ones that I was able to take a picture and post of. That stick on the right corner that I'm holding, I, ah, I forget what they're called. Um, I call them the hidden sticks, but those are used predominantly in a lot of protests, very particularly in the 60s and 70s, kind of to like 
counter protest to hit people with, um, but also is like a sign to protest. So I got to hold one of those and I can't even imagine the history behind that. Like who held it? Where was it used? Uh, it was just like absolutely amazing. And you can see other protest posters in there. So Ohara Institute was absolutely incredible. And University of Tokyo is another one that I chose to go to. It's also called Todai University. And the reason I chose this is because that picture um, right in the center there. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a very renowned um, student protest where they occupied that building in particular. And um, it ended with the death of a female student. And that is still very much ingrained in the Japanese consciousness because what the university did is they called riot police to break up the students who um, at that time were spreading a lot of consciousness about like working conditions and anti-war sentiment and a lot of other things to other universities uh, across Japan. And it just, it ended so violently. and. So I, what I've gotten from that is that so many universities, when I talked to them or when I asked about social justice and protest, um, it almost seemed like a collective trauma because of how much it was publicized in the 60s and 70s, especially for people who were alive then to remember that. When I would mention that, they would say, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't talk about that. We can't discuss these things on campus. And I suspect and then also based on some of the literature I read, it's because of that really well-known um, protest that took place here. So I think it was called the Todai Riots. And there's a lot of really cool links uh, that I included on the history of that. So I was able to go to the University of Tokyo Library, the Tokyo Special Collections, and the University of Tokyo Archives. The archives was amazing because clearly they had archived this entire um, the Todai riots, they had signs, they had helmets, they had sticks, they had a bunch of ephemera, it was really neat. And then I got to see, because space clearly is very limited in Japan, especially for universities, their automated book retrieval system, which you see down there. Um, so this isn't related to social justice, but it was really interesting. It was like this huge, huge, huge underground thing in this like little robot arm, like went and picked little books. So a student would request a book and it would just be like, boop, and grab a little book and then bring it right back up to the top. So that's how they um, handle their book collections, but they also put it underground to avoid flooding um, from uh, tsunamis and hurricanes and stuff, but also to protect against um, earthquakes, which happen a lot in Japan. I will tell you all about those experiences in a minute. So University of Tokyo, very beautiful, really awesome history. Um, and then I went to Rikyo University, same thing. Uh, the library was what you would imagine. Their libraries are very similar to ours, lots and lots of study space, um, a couple stacks, very general collections, just like my other ones. But what I was really looking for was the Research Center for Cooperative Civil Societies. And oh, I wish I could post more pictures about this, but I just saw some of the most amazing stuff and the woman who led it um, was absolutely incredible. Oh my goodness, she knew so much and showed me some really amazing stuff, particularly about um, like post-war occupation and how uh, I believe China was helping to smuggle Japanese and US soldiers out of the country. And she showed me like a falsified passport and all sorts of stuff, it was so cool. It was really neat. Um, I actually don't think I included a link for that. I will update that document after this, but Rikyo University was great. So the National Diet is like the equivalent of um, our Library of Congress. So this is the main state library. Um, and there wasn't a, a whole lot here, but it was very, very interesting to understand how the National Diet works how they sanction materials, how they don't sanction some materials. And again, I cannot post a lot of pictures, but this is what the national diet looks like. It is really difficult to get access, which is one of those um, reasons why the Japanese Library Association was so awesome and helpful. Like getting at, just getting access to this was incredible. And the woman that gave me the tour who happened to be in that rotation is the, National Diet Library Outreach Coordinator at the time was so fantastic. So much so that I was able to meet up with her 
after this because she was very aware of um, feminist issues in Japan. And there was a very high profile trial happening while I was there about the um, rape of a woman who was a reporter. So she met up with me after that and just gave me like all these articles, like a binder full of stuff. She was amazing. So really the people that I met um, like really made it for me. I've learned so much from them, even if I didn't necessarily get that much out of the building, it was still amazing to see, to see behind the scenes and how they work. Um, and that was that. And I still communicate with um, her now. She often sends me stuff and we talk about issues of social justice. So it's really cool. And then here's the National Museum of Japanese History, which again, couldn't take pictures, but it was absolutely fascinating. I went here um, because they talked a lot about Ainu and Okinawans, uh, which are discriminated against indigenous groups in Japan and only until very recently within the past couple of years have even gained like some recognition under the law, but are facing a lot of what um, indigenous groups in the United States are facing as well. So it was so interesting to be able to see that parallel um, and how imperialism and globalization and um, like how capitalist economies and everything just disrupt and destroy uh, like indigeneity and indigenous life in different countries and how they're the same and different. Um, so for example, I knew an Okinawan language wasn't recognized for a long time. They were often sent to re-education schools, which was highly familiar to me. And so it was interesting being able to talk to not only the gallery directors, but my translators about those parallels um, and about how horrifying they were and about how governments have been um, unresponsive. So particularly, and I don't um, want to seem critical at all because I really appreciate being sent to Japan and the JLA, uh, so I'll have to be a little careful, but particularly under Shinzo Abe's government and his grandfather, who is also prime minister, um, a lot of those rights have been kind of reversed or not, um, not offered to indigenous peoples of Japan. So I also went to the Okubo Public Library. The reason I chose this is because it's in Shinjuku City, which is the largest city in the Tokyo metropolitan area. It has, um, uh, it has the largest population, but it also has the largest concentration of ethnic Korean or Zainichi people in Japan who are very, very often discriminated against. So um, if you read my project proposal, I speak a little bit about it, but there are a lot of ultra-nationalist um, right-wing groups in Japan who frequently uh, protest against and even harm a lot of ethnic Korean peoples. So Japan is generally a fairly homogenous society. They don't allow a lot of uh, migrants or immigrants in. They don't take in refugees. And so uh, this has created kind of a system or an understanding that leads to a lot of very, very intense uh, racism in Japan. So I was really interested to see how public libraries who serve majority Korean populations would handle that. And the librarian was absolutely amazing. I don't quite understand how he's been the librarian for so long here because of that rotating system. And I tried to ask, but it was so difficult to understand. So hopefully I don't misrepresent anything in this presentation, but there's just so much information I learned undoubtedly um, just because I had so little time, I'm, I'm probably going to misrepresent a little bit, but but he has been the librarian and he does these like absolutely amazing programs, always pushes for funding of particular multicultural books or books in Korean, um, does a lot of story times and other uh, things with children. So it was so fascinating and he was just such a fantastic person. Um, man. I'm already running out of time. So I'm going to go real quick through Kyoto. Um, I went to Doshisha University where I got to sit in on an information literacy class that was in Japanese. So I can speak a little bit of Japanese reading as a little more difficult. Thankfully, they use a lot of um, 
texts that's in English. Uh, but so it was really interesting to see how they introduced concepts of information literacy in Japan, because when I asked a lot of universities if fake news was a problem in Japan, they said, absolutely not. That's very American. That doesn't exist. But then when I asked the activists if that was true, they said, yes, it's really horrible. It's state sanctioned. It's government sanctioned. We often have to collectivize and publish our own information in the form of zines and stuff. So, um, so it's interesting to see how that integrates into education and information literacy and how people are taught to um, evaluate, critically evaluate or not their own news and their own media. Um, and then I went to Kyoto University. So I wanted to include this, this image of interlibrary loan and everything because most libraries and universities have really cute little characters that um, represent them. This was one of my favorites. It's this little puppy and it's very sleepy, but it has this hat on and the hat is like a little monster alien that helps think for it. And they like, they're just all over the place. They are so cute. So, so cute. So little mascots. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit faster because I'm running out of time. Got five minutes. So some of my personal research, I cannot share a lot of this because a lot of the identities of the people I talked to had to be kept secret. In fact, as I was talking to one group of people in particular, there was a raid on one of their headquarters. Um, and it was very, very dramatic and difficult. Um, so one thing I did, because this is right next to the National Diet, is I visited the Liberal Democratic Party headquarters. So this is Shinzo Abe's headquarters. There wasn't anything I could do there, clearly. Um, but I just kind of wanted to see it. Um, there were also a lot of protests outside of this particular building while I was there on a variety of different issues. There was a lot of climate protests. Um, there was a lot of sexual violence protests. Um, and I did get to see some ultra-right protesters um, protesting against um, allowing refugees in or ethnic Koreans and stuff like that. So it was very fascinating to see. Um, but I couldn't participate that much because the police were there. Uh, and so I just kind of kind of watched. Another one of my favorite places that I visited was the Irregular Rhythm Asylum. This is a really well-known zine bistro and DIY area in um, Shinjuku. So it's in, I believe it's Nichome, the gay district. And so this is just some pictures of their spaces, of the zines that they were selling. I met some students from Canada who were traveling there, who were also activists and organizing climate strikes and a bunch of stuff. And I got in contact with them, bought a lot of zines. So this was incredibly interesting. And just to hear some of the perspectives from someone who um, was self-employed, um, kind of running this DIY thing, um, and then might have been like looked at in a certain way in Japanese society. To hear his opinions was really fascinating. I also went to Cafe Lavanderia, where uh, this is known as the Antifa headquarters of Tokyo, um, and it was really awesome. They were very excited that I was American and that I was particularly from Arizona because they had just had a um, like an Antifa kind of radical artist that was performing there. So there's a lot of performances here. They sell a lot of books and zines. Those little orange cats are kind of their mascots. It was really, really neat. I absolutely love going here. This is also in Nichome, which is a gay district. And I visited some student organizations. So there's club headquarters up there. I went and visited student organizations that publish zines. So I went to Uprising at Temple University. And another one of my favorite places is I visited these really old dormitories. And these are important because dorms are laid out very differently or were historically in Japan where students actually to some degree owned and operated their own dorms and they were these really autonomous spaces. But after a lot of the student protests, those were kind of done away with. And Yoshida residence was actually in, um, I don't know if it's called court there, but something similar where they were trying to uh, retain control of their dorm. And I couldn't take any pictures there, but again, lots of really awesome links. The same thing with the Kumada residents. I actually got to meet um, the modern Zengaku in there who 
uh, as a historically like activist student organization. It was it was mind blowing, like so fantastic. And then that's their their door there. And you can actually see some of the scorch marks from the 60s when they tried to when the riot police tried to weld through their door to get the students out and they were like holed up in there. So I got to meet the modern students of Zengakura and one of which who was recently kicked out of school um, in October and I included a link in there and in my blog for passing out leaflets um, that were talking about like anti-nuclear power and anti-war and stuff like that. So don't have a lot of time but as for cultural immersion that was important too. The food in Japan is the most amazing thing I've ever had in my life and I miss it every single day. I am so sad that I can't eat Japanese food. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it was so good, so good. Trains are huge in Japan. I thought well, the subway system is very anxiety inducing, but also very, very fun. I got to ride the Shinkansen, which is the high speed train. It goes like 320 miles an hour or something like that. So amazing. Have a newfound love for trains. Lots of shrines and temples to visit. Um, my favorite was the Gotokuji temple, which was really far out and there's a bunch of little lucky cats there. Lots and lots of attractions to see in Japan. So I did all of this on my downtime, which was usually in the evenings because I overscheduled myself with interviews, but lots of stuff. And you all can go back through this. Also, uh, if you go at a certain time of the year, Japan um, is prone to a lot of typhoons, but also earthquakes. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that blue dot is me and that Typhoon Hagibis, which uh, was not on the news a lot in the US at the time, was one of the biggest typhoons to hit Japan in like, I don't remember, it was like 50 or 100 years or something like that. It was huge. Uh, clearly, I live in Arizona. I've never experienced a typhoon. It was terrifying. And at the time, I happened to be staying on the top floor of this huge hotel. Um, give it I've got to hand it to Japan. <laughs> Their buildings are really well built, but it was definitely swaying and I was definitely terrified. Um, but you can tell Japanese people are so used to it because I kept asking, well, what should I do? What should I do? They're like, oh, just don't go outside. I was like, all right, <laughs> I, won't, I won't go outside. So I did not go outside. Um, anyway, it was scary. And simultaneously, as the typhoon made landfall, and it made landfall right where I was staying in the Tokyo Bay area, there was also a large earthquake. Um, I have also never experienced an earthquake. So I got very culturally immersed when I was in Japan. So, um, oh no, that slide's wrong. So there is some further reading here. If any of you are interested in learning about the history of protest in Japan and some contemporary history. And then I do wanna thank everyone who made my trip and experience possible. So the Horner Fellowship Committee, specifically Sarah Kordemeyer, the Japanese Library Association, so Miyura-san, and my translators who I absolutely love and adore, and they checked on me during the typhoon. Oh, they're so wonderful and sent me food. So Koizumi-san, Tuara-san, Hirata-san, Kamada-san, and Yanagi-san, they are absolutely amazing. And all the students and activists who I got to talk to. Okay, Q&A time. Oh, that's broken. Thank you so much, Ashley. So we have a few questions for you. Yes. So the first, so how did your experience change or affect your library practices when you returned? Yeah, so like I mentioned in my project proposal and just a little bit is that I was really looking for um, an understanding of transnational justice as it's rooted um, in critical information literacy practice, but also community outreach. So, oh, it's so hard to describe in words, but I felt very humbled having to, one, survive on my own in Japan, but understand that it's important that people have different opinions and understand uh, issues of discrimination differently. So that way, when I teach information literacy classes, when I do outreach for students, whether or not they're international, um, I guess it just helped me be a little bit softer or more patient and understanding in my approach. Um, but also one thing besides just like affecting my personal pedagogy and understanding is um, 
I connected a lot of zine activist groups. So we have a zine group at ASU um, and I connected them directly with um, Sophia Speaks and Uprising and now they exchange zines. So we're kind of creating like a transnational DIY collective of student organizers and activists who are now informing each other about uh, international perspectives of justice and stuff like that. And that's ongoing. And I'm hoping to write a paper on it and establish, just kind of make that a lot bigger, connect them with like zine distros, try to get a lot more Japanese and Indonesian, particularly zines over here. Um, so stuff like that, just one example. Great, yeah, that's a wonderful partnership to keep going. I'm gonna go ahead and pop my webcam on so so everyone can see what's going on. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so when um, you were meeting with the Japanese Library Association and you met some of the previous Horner Fellows in Japan, did they have any memories or thoughts that they shared with you that about their experiences in America? So sort of the reverse of, of your thoughts that, that you remember that you can share? Yeah, a couple of them. Oh, someone who I met over dinner, she was so cool. I noticed that she was um, signing, but using Japanese sign language. And I, I um, really love um, American sign language and deaf culture. And so she was talking to me about her experience, both um, as a Japanese person living in Japan, learning sign language, but also when she visited here, her project was on disability and accessibility, which is also something that I'm very passionate about. So we got really excited and we're just talking all dinner long and showing each other um, different signs and talking about different ways that communities are treated. Um, and she said she was really impressed when she visited the United States, but there were like some differences. So some ways that Japan is accessible are like some of the ways that the United States isn't and vice versa. And accessibility for different types of disabilities was like very different and disparate between Japan and the United States, which I also noticed when I was there. Um, yeah, so that was one, one thing that I was really interested in. Another person, um, she said she really enjoyed it, but what she remembered most was the heat, how hot it was. And I actually heard that a lot from a lot of people. Um, and in response, I was like, yes, it is very humid here. <laughs> so. That makes sense. Yeah. So especially depending on what time of year they're coming to Arizona. Yeah, and it's usually in the summer-ish time. So <laughs> quite warm. Oh, and the so, lack of public transit, they, they were also shocked at, which, same. <laughs> you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation, um, but I'm wondering for potential applicants, how much, um, you know, did you learn Japanese ahead of time before you applied, or was that something you did in, in between in advance of your trip? You know, how much should applicants you know worry if, if they don't speak any Japanese or haven't studied it before before applying? From what I understand most applicants don't speak Japanese. Um, I have been studying uh, Japanese student activism for so long that I just found it important to know and learn Japanese just so that I wasn't having to read translations or only read things in English because those give you a very specific um, viewpoint of something. I don't think it's necessary to know Japanese, especially because um, technology makes it so easy, like Google Translate. Um, I even carried around like a little binder of helpful, helpful phrases. And most interactions in Japan, and this is what actually helped with my anxiety a lot, most of the interactions are very, um, like exactly what you would expect. Like you walk into a store and they say, welcome, this much money. Thank you very much. Have a good day. So you, you get used to it very, very quickly. Um, and and the, the stereotype that a lot of Japanese people know English is absolutely not true. Um, during the days where it was really hard for me to communicate and I would try to say something in English, nothing. So I wouldn't rely on that, but technology makes it a lot easier. Um, and I did brush up on my Japanese 
beforehand. So I had to relearn a lot of stuff because clearly I don't have a lot of people to talk to here. But even then, like my Japanese is really limited. So um, yeah. Okay, great. That's that's good to know for the, all the potential applicants out there. Yeah. Do you have any like advice or tips for people looking to apply for next year? Yeah, pick something that you absolutely love and care about and I would research a little bit of it um but I don't know that's hard to say as long as you really love what you're doing and are really passionate about it I think that comes through to the Horner Fellowship Committee um yeah I don't really know and I just started on the Horner Fellowship Committee so <laughs> <laughs> there are, um, I believe a lot of the committee is listed on that website that was linked in that document. Um, and I'm sure any one of them would be happy to be reached out to too. They probably have really good advice because some of them have been on that committee for years and years and years and have had made, or have made multiple trips to Japan. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Well, that is all of the questions that I have for you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Yeah. We're just switching over here. Okay. And thank you all for being with us today. And thank you to the Arizona Library Association for sponsoring today's webinar. Don't forget to take our brief survey at the end of this webinar. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of the webinar, a participation certificate, and a link to next month's webinar on August 13th Cultural Competencies in the Workplace with panelists Elise Jordan, Sheila Paul Shedd, Jessica Sallow, and Brad Bogus. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.